Welcome to another episode of Comedy Wham Presents with me, your host, Valerie. ComedyWham.com is your place to go for features about all Austin comedy. We bring you articles and podcasts featuring the best in Austin comedy in all its shapes and formats. Started in 2016, the podcast project brings you funny people and their stories. As a fan, I like to delve into a comic's background and motivations and will usually take a detour along the way. Consider the interview a way for you to get to know the folks that make the Austin comedy scene one of the best in the country. Today I sit down with somebody who's got a pretty impressive resume. I mean, if people are thinking you go to Harvard, then our guest pretty much has Harvard-level credentials. He served as the artistic director of Boom Chicago in Amsterdam and directed Boom Chicago Rockstars at Second City, which is a mouthful, and he not only studied, but he taught at Second City Chicago and Cleveland. And that is pretty amazing because Second City Chicago is world renowned. And then when he and his wife, thank you, when he and his wife settled in Austin, he quickly made, well actually they made a name for themselves uh, with a handful of improv troops and claimed Cold Town Theater as their home theater. And he's been serving as executive produ producer at Cold Town. And the great occasion for our getting together is to preview the upcoming Out of Bounds Festival, which takes over the local performance venues in Austin over Labor Day weekend. And he serves as the senior producer of Out of Bounds Festival. And now Comedy Wham presents our guest, Dave Buckman. Hello. 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 Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Hello. 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 This venue is going to give me a heart attack. It's the Driscoll Hotel, y'all. <laughs> uh, yeah. On Usually it's such a night. lovely venue. You wouldn't think on a Tuesday night oh, it would no. be this rocking. But, you know, hey. Uh, I like to uh, kick off these interviews by asking my guests one word to describe your past. My past? Your past. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> my past. One word to describe my past. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> laughter. That seems fitting. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I just, I've always gravitated, gravitated towards the funniest people in the room. Yeah. My whole life, all my friends growing up were always funnier than me. Uh-huh. Um, so I just wanted to be around funny people and make other funny people laugh. Yeah. Um, so I just always made sure that, you know, I've had lots of friends who are jerks and assholes, but because they're funny, they kind of want to give it to them, and they're funnier than they were, more than they were mean. Yeah. So they, they got, they, which is un, rare for me, but I've had friends, friendships with very, very funny assholes. No. <laughs> I have some people in that category too. Mm -hmm. That's a universal. Um, yeah. Maybe. So yeah. Being sense of humor overrides a lot for me. Yeah. Where did you grow up? I grew up in southern New Jersey. Okay. So I tell people not Sopranos, New Jersey, but Boardwalk Empire, New Jersey. Okay. That area between Philadelphia and Atlantic City. Okay. And so we spent equal times in both of those cities and we lived in the suburbs in between. Okay. And do you have early comedic memories? Things oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. My grandfather, A.B., was very funny. And his brother-in-law, Buddy, uh, was very funny. And I would watch them kind of hold court hmm. and tell a joke and tell a story. And they were... They were like the first people I saw. Like, I want, I want to kind of be that kind of person. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, Mel Brooks movies and Woody Allen movies and early Saturday Night Lives and yeah. uh, you know, the Marx Brothers films that got a hold of me at a very early age. At what point did you start performing? Performing. Early on, I think I knew that I liked to be on stage, and I, I could I felt confident there. Um, how, how early? I'd say the earliest I remember being on stage was um, me and my sister and a best friend of mine dressed up as the Chipmunks and lip synced a <laughs> Chipmunks song for a talent show. I think I'm, I want to say like 
eight and six and eight we were. Uh, um, and we won. We were the only ones in our category, so we won. Uh-huh. It was the greatest night of my life. I did a trumpet solo for what was supposed to be the sax solo. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, for um, it was a Billy Joel song, You May Be Right. It was a sax solo. And I ran, I, I ran back, got my trumpet, did the trumpet solo, brought down the house. I must have been eight years old. And I just, I knew, I was like, this is easy. Yeah. Because I kind of knew what the, what the audience would like. And as an eight-year-old, how do you chase that high? Oh, it took a while. Um, you know, trying out for plays. And when I didn't get the plays, still doing the tech, I, you know, my fourth grade play, I cried. I was not picked to be in the cast, but mm. I still went up and did the spotlight. I was in the tech booth for that show. Uh-huh. And so it sounded like, oh, you can still be part of the show and uh, still en- entertain the audience mm. and not have to be the center of attention at the same time. Yeah. Um, so that's probably, that's a really good lesson. I'm really glad somebody took me aside and helped me do that because that was a lot of fun being up there. Yeah. Um, so, getting in touch with both sides of production, being on stage and mm-hmm. behind it. Did you continue to do theater beyond fourth grade? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did plays. I was in the end, Diary of Anne Frank in eighth grade. Uh, I was assistant director of Hello Dolly in my senior year in high school and then um, into college. And I you know, did plays in college and started an improv troupe in college. So. You always, started the I start, improv. I started improv college at uh, Troopman College 20 years ago. That's still there. Oh wow! And I just found out recently that they're still doing shows there. Wow! In DC, yeah. And I mean, I remember my time in college. I had no clue what improv was in college. Right. Uh, I felt I was in speech and debate, so I felt like I had some connection to performance. But how did you? St- how did you learn about improv to let alone start an improv group? All of my heroes had an improv background. So when I'd go and research who Dan Aykroyd was, or Phil Hartman was, or Belushi, or Robin Williams, or Jonathan Winters, or the Marx Brothers, yeah. it kept, or Bill Murray, all these people that are like, like, wow, these guys are awesome. Where'd they come from? They all came from the Groundlings in Second City, every yeah. single one of them. I was like, well, I don't know what the Second City is, but I have to go there. Because every person I like on television is from the Second City. Down to like, like Hamilton Camp, who you'd never heard of, but he played Don Knotts' brother on Three's Company. There's these character actors that'd be like, that guy's awesome, who's that guy? I look him up on Encyclopedia, you know, figure it out. He's from Second City. Uh. Joan Rivers from Second City. Ed Asner from Second City. So I was like, well, I don't know what that is, but after college, I got to go to Second City. Okay. And so I did. But you, but you started an improv troupe in college. In college. Okay. Yeah. So you, I mean, that was By that setting time, the groundwork I, for. I wanted to get out of college and go to Second City or the Groundlings, and I took workshops in college. I opened up um, the. I guess the Washington Post had a theater section. And every once in a while there'd be like workshops and auditions in the theater section. And there was a workshop with, from the second city, Michael Gelman. Uh, and Michael Gelman was Bill Murray's understudy. And he was a teacher at the second city. He was just traveling through, doing a workshop at a church in Falls, Falls Church, Virginia. And I got in my car as a junior in college and I drove in a snowstorm. I was literally the only car without four wheel drive on a highway in a snowstorm, everything else was a truck with, you know, I shouldn't have been out there, but I drove like 50 miles to this workshop. At the time of my life, knew this is like, I'm, this is, it's, it's speaking to me somehow, and I asked, I asked him afterwards, how can you, how can I do this? And so just keep doing it, and so I did. I went back to, took a comedy sports workshop in Roslyn, Virginia, and then, learned some improv games and then taught other theater students how to play these improv games and then we were an improv troupe. Wow. And then we just started doing shows on campus and then we were a thing and then people started to seeing us and I led the troupe since it, I just, I don't know, I've always been kind of like this person in the group that ends up leading the group. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what group I'm in. Um, and I've just been doing that ever since college. And so college was still in the Northeast. In D.C., yeah. And 
then you had you made a beeline for well, Chicago. Well, I, I made let me make a beeline. I tried to go to New York for a summer. That didn't work out. I came back to DC, stuck around that improv troupe for a couple years after I graduated. I mean, didn't mean I got on campus. <laughs> uh, they graduated, but still doing improv shows. <laughs> it's like the Rodney Dangerfield character, whatever I, that movie was. I uh, forgot the name of it. Easy Money. Okay. I just saw it the other day. Oh. <laughs> no, not Easy Money. Back to School. There we go. Back yeah, to I'm school. like Easy Money. Not yeah. Easy Money. Because I'd rather be in Easy Money than Back to School. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so. Uh, we went to a couple of improv festivals and you know you start seeing people and you're hearing about Chicago and mm -hmm. you know right I wrote a letter to Second City I went, uh, Second City came to DC to do a touring company show and I at, and I went to go see it and I didn't know what the Second City show was but it was a sketch show which was completely yeah. different than anything I'd ever done but it had Tina Fey in that cast <laughs> and Amy Poehler was in that cast wow and Ali Farnakian who runs the Pitt, Pitt Theater up in New York okay. um, was in that cast and uh just an, it was an amazing show and it blew my mind. I had never seen long form improv before that show. I'd never seen professional sketch before that show. Um, and it's like, well, that's, I gotta go there. I gotta go there. So I did. And do you just show up and. I, well, my, my, this is actually a funny story. My college troupe, I, was gonna, I decided to move up to Chicago and it coincided with the same weekend that. Uh, they got a gig down in Austin at the Big Stinking Improv Festival huh. in 1997. So I moved all my stuff out to Chicago, got an apartment underneath a, uh, a college friend of mine, and then immediately drove my car down to Austin with some friends to do my last show with my college troupe uh, in what is now uh, the Velveeta Room. I must have been the Velveeta Room back then, too. Wow. Yeah, it must have been the Velveeta Room, but it was the Velveeta Room. Uh, and I remember seeing shows at the Ritz. I remember this hotel. Uh -huh. I remember seeing a show at the Paramount or the State. We watched the State at the Paramount. Oh wow! Um, they all got naked. It. So uh, that was a so that was my first time in Austin. Yeah. I moved back to Chicago and just started interning at Second City. Okay. And given that all of your heroes uh, had. The, the background at, at Second City, how yep. is it to walk around? I've, I used to live in Chicago, okay. and I remember going to Second City, yeah. and I was always starstruck seeing the gallery oh of photos. Oh my God, I was going there to work. Yeah. So I'd go there, my first job there was a, 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 as an usher, where you walk people to their seats, you yeah. make frozen pizzas, and clean up the puke, <laughs> and tell people to shush, <laughs> and hang out in the uh, hallway, and then you go out with the cast and drink after work. Yeah. And then you go to your day job at six in the morning, you sleep at your desk, <laughs> wait, you get to Second City at five o'clock, and uh -huh. do it all over again. And you know, uh, it was so much fun because yeah, it's intimidating. Tina Fey was up on the main stage by that point, not yeah. touring anymore. Um, and uh, Horatio Sands was in the, you know, the ETC stage. And so you'd see these amazing people. You'd see, there's this great picture of Ed Asner they used to have in the lobby. They would greet you as, you as you walked in when he was like 30 years old and tough looking. And you get so intimidated looking at these pictures. And yeah. Just hoping one day that, gosh, one day I hope my picture's up on the wall somewhere there. And, <laughs> It's it's very uh, cult, it's very culty, mm -hmm. you know, and you just want your you just want to be recognized yeah. as having talent as someone there. Yeah. So you're working there as an intern, and mm -hmm. are you taking the, the classes? Uh, yeah, they're taking the classes. We get okay. a discount on classes for working there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and meeting lots of friends. Uh, Jordan Peele was an intern then, and Ike Barinholtz was an intern then, and wow. uh, all these amazing people. Uh, Amazing people that went on to amazing things that were yeah. just like we're just working in the box office and the talent selling t shirts. Crazy. Uh, yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun. And just hanging out and seeing shows and uh, learning. And then, you know, there's Improv Olympic there and the United you know, Theater there. And I took classes in all those places and comedy sports up there. And so there's um, lots of, it was like a college town yeah. with lots of different colleges, just the way Austin is now here. But there's lots of different opportunities to learn different places mm -hmm. and try to get on their stages. What were you, um, as, as your career started to take shape, 
what was it that you most loved other than this I, this ambition to have your picture yeah. on, on the gallery uh -huh, you know uh -huh. what was it that you loved about being on the stage and obviously the camaraderie is coming yeah, camaraderie is here. a big thing i think for me it was entertaining an audience people who chose to spend their dollars not going to a movie not going to a restaurant but coming to see your show because they need a, you know they need a laugh and yeah. like really doing everything i can to help them get that laugh help yeah. them get that laugh and for me the best the drug I've been chasing is that, that out to a good improv show where you know the thing you're going to say is going to make the lights go out and then yeah. you say it and then the lights go out. There's no better drug in the world than that feeling of knowing how that show's going to end before it ends and yeah. it does and huh. you provided it and you just parked the car yeah. and the audience <laughs> loved it. It was. I get those maybe two or three a year now, but uh, yeah, I was going to ask you how yeah. often does that not does often, that happen? but it's a good it's a good one to chase. Yeah. And how many years were you uh, doing the classes and, mm -hmm. and forming these friendships before you started teaching there? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I you know it. It took me uh, directing first before I was teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, I, how did I fall into this? Um, I was coaching improv troops after a year or two. And then um, some poker buddies of mine put up a play. They got well received and I, I directed it. They were all in it I directed it. Okay. Um, at the same time, I got asked to assistant direct the Second City Main Stage 40th Anniversary Show. Nice. Um, because I really wanted to direct. I liked directing more than I liked performing at that point. Um, and so, and then at that time I got the Bloom Chicago job. So all those three things kind of happened right in a row in the same, in the same quarter, really. Mm -hmm. That play, Second City, and then the show, the 40th anniversary show at Second City, and then 10 days later I was in Amsterdam. Wow. What year was the 40th anniversary? 1999. So this is okay. December 1999, okay. just before Y2K. Okay. Because I was in Chicago at that time, and I was going to Second City regularly. Yeah. There's, a, there's a good chance I saw that sure, show. For so sure. that's amazing. It's called Second City 4.0. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, yeah. My memory's not that good. <laughs> I just know I would regularly go to Second yeah. City shows. Um, for those of us who are more of a stand-up. Uh, uh -huh. aficionado uh, tell me what Boom Chicago is Boom Chicago and why it's in Amsterdam why it's in <laughs> Boom Chicago was started by uh, three Chicago improvisers um, from Northwestern University uh, literally 25 years ago mm -hmm. this summer I'm going out there for the 25th anniversary nice uh, I'll be there when this airs probably oh. I'm <laughs> excited about that um, it is a live stage show in Amsterdam, English speaking mostly, uh, that is a combination of short form improv games, like you'd see on Whose Line Is It Anyway, okay. and sketches that they write. Um, and the material veers between Dutch political and European political humor and, you know, weed, weed stoner prostitute humor for the tourists. <laughs> so in the winter, it's more for Dutch businesses, and uh -huh. in the summer, it's more for American Australian tourists. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it's about the culture of living in Amsterdam. Uh -huh. They, you know, they write new sketches every year, and they create new improv games every year, and they call it a show. Um, there's a Best of Boom cast, and there's American improvisers and sketch comedians from New York, Chicago, LA, London, and now Austin. We've actually sent two people yeah. from the Austin improv community to be in the Boom Chicago cast, which is huge that we're even like on that list right. of cities sending people to be in the boom camps. Yeah, because it's a like it's a global operation. It is. They tour all over Europe and the world. They do shows in Singapore and Australia and Greece and uh, Edinburgh's Fringe Festival yeah. and uh, Barcelona and kind of like they're the second city of Europe. Yeah. Um, so you get a real formal training and um, when I was there it was just a murderer's row of comedians. Mm -hmm. um, that are all millionaires now. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so you you went to Amsterdam and then you came back and directed the I went back to Chicago okay so I really wanted my name on that wall <laughs> I really wanted my picture up on that lobby I felt like that was uh -huh. the most important thing in the world to me I probably should have gone, probably should have gone to New York uh, to pursue late night comedy writing dreams but I really thought Chicago was um, I needed that um, and it ended up being you know the best choice uh, because I found my path here. Yeah. Uh, but I went back to Chicago to direct. I was teaching and coaching and directing a touring company. And they sent me out to Cleveland to put up a show where I ended up meeting my, my wife, yeah. who was an understudy at the Second City there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was great. It was a great time. And I learned a lot directing at Second City. It was harder in a lot of ways than it was at Boom. Uh, Boom was really like mm. college for me, uh, or it was really like master's degree, yeah. and then in Second City was like a PhD, mm -hmm. and learning, uh, yeah. up-leveling my game. Okay, so now now you have a, a performing wife. Yes. She's in Cleveland? She's in Cleveland. She getting she her ma she was getting her master's at Case Western okay. to be a therapist. And I don't know, we do long distance for a year, I go back to Chicago, she's in Cleveland. Uh, I, it's time for me to leave Chicago, and I just realized I'm, I don't know what where I'm going next, but Rachel's going to be a part of that. So I moved to Cleveland uh -huh. with the intention of getting her to move out of Cleveland. <laughs> well, I, we can we can today say that you succeeded. I did. So. Yeah. yeah, and then we we we're going to go to LA together, but you know, we chose Austin because it had kind of more what we're looking for, which is just like having a life and a performing life. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we didn't want to like struggle just to do shows. We just wanted to do shows and have a life. Yeah. And Austin was, seemed like it could provide that for us. You had done the show in Austin that one time when you were moving to Chicago, you moved to Chicago, dropped off your stuff, drove yeah, down to 97, Austin. Yeah, 97, yeah. Had you been to Austin since? No. No, but we, we, came, down he, that we came down here for a wedding uh, and found a place uh -huh. and decided this is where we're, and we've been, literally been in the same apartment uh -huh. since that wow. trip, and that was 2004. Uh -huh. And how did you figure out the landscape of, of Austin, or did, had you done your homework? I mean, you sound like you've done plenty of homework in figuring out, <laughs> you know, What's the best improv scene for me to oh, be in? in there, was, there was only one improv scene here at the time. There was, was there the was, hideout? It was the hideout, and there was only 30 people doing improv in all of Austin. And it was all, you either played maestro, uh -huh. or you uh, were on a troupe that opened for Polite Society Presents, which was Andy Crouch and uh, Caitlin uh, Sweet Lamb and uh, Mike Kersenfeld, and they were the headlining troupe on Saturday night. And so you either open for them or you played on my show, and that was all there was. Huh. So how did that feel coming from the vaunted Second City? Well, I had also gone to Cleveland and kind of, I was not a good improviser when I left Chicago. Mm. I want to stress that. Like, I had kind of like oh. not, directing for the many years stunted my actual improv growth. Oh, interesting. So not doing it. And not doing it with like my peers for a long time really made me a bad improviser. And I took kind of doing it uh, low stakes in a bar in Cleveland every Tuesday night jam, and like really that's my only access to it. Yeah. To really kind of refocus. Um, and it took again another, I think another two years of being in Austin before I got kind of good again. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I had some training, so I was able to like trick yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. But I was not that good of improviser when I got here, but I think I had some tricks up my sleeve. I could yeah. Now, is this you being overly humble? I don't. Because, I mean, you, you, you don't, you can't be a bad improviser and be part of Boom Chicago. And you can't, I mean, you just, yeah. you can't teach at Second City if you're bad. Right. Well, I had a pedigree at that point, so it's hard to say no to my pedigree, I think. I don't know. Mm. I mean, I wasn't terrible, but I was making bad moves. Mm. And I wasn't playing with people that... Like, the people that wanted to play with me, I wasn't like, I was like, oh, I'm better than, I was a lot of my judgment in my head about mm. my peers and what they thought of me and, um, you know, the political side of 
all that world kind of got the better of me in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of burned bridges, a lot of weird feelings, and like just it didn't, it wasn't, I wasn't comfortable and I was making a lot of bad choices on stage with people that I didn't feel trusted me or I didn't, you know what I mean? So yeah, there was, sure. it was, it was, you know, it got weird. Yeah. Well, it's a very different environment than what, you know, the stand up where it's just you go on stage yeah. yourself and you no. bomb by yourself. You, you make your own bad decisions. Yeah. You have to collaborate and you have to be a good listener. And I wasn't a good listener because I was mm. very passive aggressive and very kind of shut down from the experience of. You know, I got let go from being Chicago. I got let go from Second City. And probably, you know, there, there were good reasons why, but also, you know, that kind of like trust issue hits you and your insecurities hit you, yeah. hit you and they kind of blow up. And whatever's going on in your life is going to come out in your improv. Yeah. Whatever, whatever walls that you're hitting in your life are the same walls that you hit at improv. So if you can break through those walls in improv, they help you break through those walls in life, which is why improv is so magical. But I was in a place improvising around that time where I had a lot of walls that I was not. Yeah. I had no idea they were there. I had no idea they were there until I met my beautiful, lovely therapist wife, Rachel, uh, who oh, knocked a, down a shit ton of those walls. Oh my gosh, it just dawned on me. Yeah, if she's trained as a therapist, she's she an amazing can really... therapist, relationship coach. So, I mean, she taught me how to listen, she taught me how to react, she taught yeah. me how to take things in, she taught me how to apologize. <laughs> good things, good things. Own some shit, own uh, some shit. Did you perform together? Uh, we do, and we have. Uh, not immediately. Uh -huh. uh, it probably took until we moved down here to start performing okay. together. And was that weird? It was weird. It was hard at first, because I was in love with her, and I um. wanted to give her every, you know, path. And like, it, just, it was hard to find our our love language on stage, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or the way we communicate on stage. And now we are super telepathic uh -huh. on stage and off stage. Like I, we're having a conversation on stage <laughs> that the audience is not even privy to. Wow. It's amazing because we can give a look to each other and we're, we know what yeah. that look means in a scene that the audience doesn't even see. And it's really a lot of fun. Huh. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun playing with her. And there, there are uh, at least a, at least two that I, th maybe three mm -hmm. couples that are like really solid uh, improv teams yeah. uh, around the city. So sure. it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> so there's but probably a lot of that community. It took a while to figure it out. Yeah. To learn each other's languages. Yeah. And then how did you? Uh, get into Cold Town Theater being your your club, your theater. Uh, so me, Rachel, and I got here in December '04. Our uh, creative there's another couple that moved down, Bob and Erica, that we formed a troupe with. They moved down in June of okay. '05, and then Hurricane Katrina happened and brought the troupe Cold Town to mm -hmm. Austin right. uh, during Out of Bounds in in August. And they stayed, the, troop, the Cold Town troops stayed and opened up a new space. They had a space we wanted to teach and we all had a similar improv background, the Chicago style improv background, mm -hmm. as opposed to the hideout that was more Johnstonian and San Francisco West Coast style of improv. It's two different, it gets real nerdy, <laughs> improv nerdy if I get too into it. But, Cold Town, the troop had the same style as we did, and mm -hmm. so we had the teaching experience, the Frank Mills, my troop. Yeah. And Cold Town had the space and the gumption and the drive to put up shows. So yeah. we we it's not like we left the hideout because we we're all friends and we still do shows at the hideout. Yeah. And they do shows at our theater, so it's not like it's like uh, big rivals. Right. Very healthy, friendly competition. But uh, we decided it was like a good opportunity and. There's nine of us there. There's four Frank Mills and five Cold Town folks, and we just kind of glommed into each other like mm -hmm. sister troops, and became the bestest of frenzies. <laughs> and when you you came to Austin, you you said there were 30 people doing improv, Roughly. and now there's I mean, thousands and people I will never know. <laughs> people I will never know. I used, there used to be a time when I knew every single person. And what troop they were on, uh -huh. and when they were playing, and I could, I was, I did the scheduling of the hideout. 
uh, back then. Uh, just organizing the troops and putting up a wall calendar. Um, and now there's people that I'll never, I don't even, I'll never know. Yeah. Which is amazing to me. And, and how does that, uh, when you were chasing your high and chasing the Second City dream and now being here, and of mm -hmm. course you've got the great partnership with your wife. Yeah. And your executive producer at Cold Town. Do you feel settled now? Do you, are you happy with where you're? I'm very happy. Yeah. I can't. I mean, if you told my 12-year-old me <laughs> that I would own a and operate a comedy club uh -huh. that featured improv, sketch, and stand-up um, in Austin, Texas, <laughs> and married to a hot, funny wife that you get to perform with, I would have. I would have been like, great. Then that's that's perfect life for me. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I would take a good gig in LA for a couple months, for sure, in New York, and you know, I could I could use a paycheck here and there. Um, so I'm not. I mean, I still want to act, and I still want to perform, and I still want to be in movies and be in TV shows and be in commercials and you know, create and write and all that stuff. But you know, I'm probably gonna. You know, I love Cold Town and I love Austin, and I'll be here as long as both of them are still doing improv. So improv is enough of what keeps you here in yeah. Austin versus whatever it might be in New York or, or L.A. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a really good question. I mean, if somebody offered me $100,000 to go to L.A., I don't, I don't know if I'd take that. I mean, other than I'd take the job, but I don't know if I'd move there for that. You know what I mean? It's Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm enamored with L.A. when I go there. I'm enamored with Manhattan when I go there. I'm enamored with Amsterdam. I'm going to... Yeah. Um, I, love, I love those gigs. I think I just want to go where, they, where the funny gigs are. And right now, Cold Town's my funny gig. Yeah. And Out of Bounds is my funny gig. And I get a lot of joy from both of them on a daily basis. I love, I love putting a festival together and then seeing it come to life and seeing the shows that... At one time, I was the only person that knew that show would happen. Mm -hmm. There was a good weekend last weekend, and I was the only person that knew what shows were going to happen. <laughs> and then, come later the weekend, I get to go to that show, and it's happening. And those are the people that I thought were going to do those things, and yeah. they're doing it. It's that's that's a really good high too. And then seeing people that were training in Cold Town go on to New York and LA and Chicago and live their dreams and yeah. do really well and get hired. To write on TV shows and yeah. um, appear on talk shows is it's so thrilling to see and inspire new generations of comics and comedians which is kind of what I've been doing in that role for most of my life whether it's my improv trooper in college or my troupe at Improv Olympic in Chicago or directing a touring company or directing amps I've always been the head comic in charge of the comics. Yeah. Um, no matter what situation I've been in since, since my Marx Brothers Club in fourth grade. Oh my goodness. I've always been <laughs> head of the comedians in whatever situation I've been in my entire life. So yeah. it's a role that's comfortable for me. And I don't know if I'd have that same luxury uh, and, and, you know, quite a privilege. Uh, you know, I get a lot of privilege being in Austin and being a big fish in this pond. And, yeah, yeah. You know, it's gonna be, it would be hard to start that over again in LA or New York. No matter how many contacts and old friends I have there, I'd still have to start at the bottom like everybody else. And it'd be hard to give, give up having too much fun here. Yeah, yeah. You're involved with two festivals, yes. Austin Sketch Fest and Out of Bounds. Yes. And Out of Bounds is pretty closely associated with Cold Town. But yep. you run, but the shows happen at all of the venues. So Austin Sketch Fest is produced by Cold Town Theater. Okay. So that's a direct correlation there. Okay. Uh, Out of Bounds happens at Cold Town Theater, but it also happens at the Hideout, at the Fallout Theater, at the Institution, at the Velveeta Room, at the Spider House. So we use all the venues that were all that are being used by all the comedians in town for yeah. the most part, by all the regular venues, and kind of highlight Austin comedy, as well as um, showing Austin audiences what else is out there that we think is cool, mm -hmm. elevating Austin comedians to that level as well, having local people 
play with people from out of town and, and play in the same bill as headliners yeah. and giving that shot of just being like, hey, I opened for this person and now that's on their resume. You know right. what I mean? Right. And really kind of showcasing to LA and New York what's, dude, there's a lot of good stuff in Austin right now and showing Austin this is what else is out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And really kind of bring the two together. Yeah. I know n not as much about the Austin Sketch Fest. How long has that been running? Uh, I'm going to say nine years. Okay. Since 2010. Okay. And that happens in late May, Mo early June? Memorial, just, Memorial okay. Day weekend. Okay. They, Austin Sketch Fest claim Memorial Day weekend as a response to <laughs> Out of Bounds <laughs> claiming Labor Day weekend, yeah. Okay, fair enough. And yeah, Out of goes, Bounds. The season goes Moon Tower in April. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, South by Southwest in March. Yeah. Moon Tower in April. Sketch Fest in May. Yeah. And then the Hot Sauce Festival in mid August. <laughs> and then Out of Bounds on Labor Day weekend. Are you involved with the Hot Sauce Festival too? No, not no. yet. I'd love to, you know. <laughs> Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and then uh, and then October, the Austin Film Festival kind of okay. comes around too. Are nice. you involved with that? I do. I host okay. their award show and do oh, a nice. lot of panels lately. Oh, my gosh. You dabble. I dabble. I interviewed Robert Townsend uh, this past festival. Uh, he wrote Hollywood Shuffle, Meteor Man. No? Oh, my God. You check out these movies. I do. <laughs> independent cinema in the, oh, uh, man. in the 80s and 90s. Okay. The godfather of independent cinema. Okay. I have homework to do. I usually don't have homework to do. You should go watch to... um, Hollywood Shuffle. I'm going to get you, sucker. Oh, I have at least heard of that one. Yeah. Uh, Meteor Man and Hollywood. Hollywood. Um, no. The Five Heartbeats. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll do my research. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so Out of Bounds, I talked to Ruby Wilman last yeah. year, yeah. and I have been attending Out of Bounds for, I think, three years oh, wow. myself, so cool. I've, I've always enjoyed it, Good. and I learn, because I, you know, I do want to... What do you learn? Because I've only known it from the inside for the last nine uh, years. Well, I learned, I'm reminded that improv is fun, because the bad thing about Austin and, and being so stand-up centric yeah. It seems is improv gets a bad rap and it shouldn't. And I know that because I my first comedy experiences were going to see Second City. Yeah. So I watched fabulous improv. And here when I started going to see shows, I would go see stand-up shows because I didn't know about right. the improv. So every time that I go to out of, out of Bounds and I see the improv shows, I'm reminded, oh, you know, there's great improv that is, you know, coming in from out of state, but also there are great troops here. And, you know, take time yeah. to see them. Don't just think, oh, stand-up is the only game in town, because it's not. It's Obviously, if it grew from 30 people to... Yeah thousand performers it's yeah. definitely not the only game in town no yeah yeah we definitely there's i mean if we could involve more disciplines we could mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah yeah it's a comedy and festival so you want to include all parts of the comedy yeah and last year i got to talk to a handful of performers and i would i went to go see their shows and you know they're all great great performers and I think they leave a nice mark on yeah we do a really I mean we have 415 troops apply this uh, acts apply this year those are sketch troops improv troops one man shows uh -huh. one, one woman shows uh, musical acts uh, stand ups um, just the whole gamut uh -huh. and variety shows and we only accepted a hundred uh, last night um, and as a fan or an, an, an audience member, I mean, the fact that I might have a chance to see a hundred <laughs> acts yeah. in a long weekend, yeah. that's intense. Yeah, well, that goes Tuesday through Monday, so mm -hmm. it's a long yeah. week. Um, we give all out-of-town acts to at least two shows. Um, yeah. So that you have it, so they have a chance to build a buzz yeah. and get people to come back and see. You know, you know, you really want to expose them to how awesome Austin audiences are. Yeah. So you said 415 uh, submitted. How does that compare to, to past years? Uh, it keeps getting more and more. I think last year wow. we had just under 400, wow. and the year before that we had about 380. So every year it's a couple dozen more. Mm -hmm. 
uh, how long have you been involved as a producer of the festival? Since 2010 was okay. my first year. So what do you think is magical and is creating that interest for performers wanting to be performers at Out of Bounds? Um, it's a lot of fun. The parties are great. The after parties are great. The shows are great. The shows are getting better every year. I think it's really... When I see a lot of the comedy festivals around Austin and mm -hmm. around Texas and around the you know, anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's mostly all just stand-ups. It's mostly all just people who are signed mm -hmm. by agencies, and it looks just basically it's an agency's roster. Yeah. On a tw on in one show, we're gonna. It's like South by, uh, but you know, Moon Tower for me feels like South by for comedians. We're just like all the agencies empty their rosters into the Paramount. Yeah. And all over this downtown, and it's just like these are the folks that are. You know, hustling and it's great and it's kind of fun, but there's a lot of unsigned talent out there, and I think Out of Bounds tries to do both. Where we try to get people you know from TV, try to get people who are amateurs, try to get people who are uh, uh, fans all in the same room, and people who are like really in the trenches of comedy yeah. too. It, fans, soldiers, generals, and <laughs> you know what I mean, and and and. and uh, and people who are just starting out mm -hmm. and really just curious and interested, all in the same room together, um, experiencing cool and eclectic lineups uh, that kind of span comedy. Uh, How do you make some of those hard decisions? Um, on? It is really hard. <laughs> it is really hard, especially when you see a troupe or uh, a stand-up that you know is better than the video that they submitted. And we, mm. we have a panel of eight stand-ups uh, judging all the stand-ups. Okay. We have a panel of eight improv and sketch comedians judging all the improv and sketch and writing acts. And there's eight of them, five scores are needed for each troop, and, and it's anonymous blind scoring. Mm. So there's no, the, the cream of the crop is going to rise to the top. And uh, the troops that may be good but sit on a bad tape, or just need a little bit more practice. They don't practice every, you know what I mean? They just, yeah. they, uh, um, or just need more reps, you know? Uh, you know, they're gonna get the middle scores and they're not gonna get into the festival. And it's really a 23 to 25 acceptance rate. And it's, you gotta, I mean, you gotta, not only do you have to be really good, yeah. but your tape has to be really good too and show that and be unique and be, have a unique point of view and be consistently funny. And grab me from the beginning. Yeah. And, you know, only one out of four really do that. Um, and there's a lot of acts that, you know, I've been in the festival the last couple of years that aren't going to get in this year because there's a lot of new troops and hungry troops. Mm. They are rehearsing every week. They are uh, putting in the time. They are putting their reps. They are getting better. Yeah. They have a unique voice. They have a unique format. They have uh, better jokes. Their, their, their jokes are tighter. There's nobody blocking the stage in their video shot. You can mm -hmm. hear everything. It's, people are putting the time and everything at a festival. So everything has to be perfect. And you have to be likable. Because <laughs> five people have to like you. Five, yeah. Strangers, yeah. five strangers have to like you. And Oof. like your acts. And be hooked by something. Uh -huh. You know, find it interesting. Yeah. Oh my God, that's so, in, that's overwhelming. It is overwhelming, and you know, I I look at all of them, mm -hmm. and I you know I'm. There's some that are obviously in based on the scores, and there's some that are obviously out based on the scores, and then there's that middle group mm -hmm. that I have to kind of comb through, and Karina Magyar has to comb through in the stand-ups and really yeah. balance out the festival to make sure that we have you know just as many women as we have men in the festival, or that we have a proper representation of people of color in the festival, mm -hmm. or LGBTQ acts around the festival and making sure that we are as diverse right. and inclusive a festival as we can be because that's a, a big stigma in a lot of comedy festivals that they're not and we really value that and really want to make sure that our festival is not just like doing like an, an Asian block mm -hmm. you know what I mean or an all women block but we're integrating the festival mm -hmm. so that when you go to see any show you're seeing a wide variety of comedy yeah yeah that came through last year when I was talking to Ruby, that, yeah. you know, just very diverse but integrated. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, are there any any teases that you can give us? <laughs> um, well, uh, we have gotten Edie Patterson. Okay. She's an Austin favorite. I think she came up here uh, in Austin Comedy, and okay. she's uh, from Vice Principals and The Last OG. Okay. Um, ah, nice. And she's bringing with her Jim Rash. Nice. Uh, from Mike Tyson's Mysteries and Community. Oh, community. This and is community. My, yep. Indeed from Community. I'm a super big fan of his. Yeah. He's an Oscar winner. Yeah, that's right. That's right, for The Descendants. Um, so they're bringing, uh, Edie's going to do a one-woman show, improv show, and then uh, Edie and Jim Rash and a bunch of other Groundlings alumni are going to come and do a short-form show, which I can't wait for. Nice. Um, it's going to be great. Um, another act we're uh, booking is Gina Yashir. Uh, she's a stand-up from The Daily Show, and of course, from The Daily Show. Okay. Uh, she was on Last Comic Standing a couple years ago, which is when I first saw her. And she's been on At Midnight, now she's on The Daily Show. Uh, she's, uh, she's fantastic. She's British. She's African American. She's brassy, and I love her. She just, like, she don't give a fuck. I, <laughs> nice. love, I love her uh, point of view. Um, we're uh, having a whole block of shows from uh, Rooster Teeth. Oh, cool. uh, the presence in town. They're going to be debuting a new documentary and doing a live streaming podcast of one of the most popular podcasts uh, at the festival, as well as doing a little improv set uh, from some of wow. the employees and some stand up too. So they've got three different blocks in the festival. Mm -hmm. It's exciting to kind of finally integrate them into what we're doing and yeah. kind of combine comedy forces. Yeah. Um, oh, we also got Gayco. Gayco Productions from Chicago uh -huh. uh, is a gay sketch troupe. Uh, they've been around for about 20 years. Okay. Um, their response to they're called Gayco because the touring companies at Second City are called Blue Co, Red Co, and Green Co. Okay. Blue Company, Red Company, Green Company. So Gayco decided to call themselves Gayco, <laughs> um, and they've been around for 20 years. I was in uh, a show of theirs. It was an understudy called. Don't ask, don't tell a tubby. Oh uh, my back God. in the, the gay Teletubby controversy, <laughs> yeah. right? And it was also around Don't Ask, Don't Tell Time, too. Uh -huh. That's how long ago this was. Um, uh, so I'm excited. They're going to bring a show down and do uh -huh. a sketch show. We've got a troupe called Kids These Days, uh, which is a sketch troupe made up of a bunch of different writers from The Daily Show, uh, Night Night with Jimmy Fallon, and The Colbert Show. They're combining to write a sketch show just for Out of Bounds. Oh, wow. Um, I think that's it for now. Okay. Well, those are good teases. Yeah, those are good teases. Any those teases for the local Austin comics that are listening? Some some fun local names that oh, we, local we names. can Oh, local names. Well, Chris Karina Magyar. She's our head of our stand-up production. She's yeah. amazing. Uh, Christina Parrish. Uh, she's a fantastic stand-up. Yeah, just amazing. Um, you know, we've got you know, Girls, 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 perennial favorites in the improv scene. Mm -hmm. um, Migas. I don't know if you've ever seen Migas. That's uh -uh. one of my favorite troops. Uh, there's so many good improv troops that I just wish more people knew about. Yeah. Um, let's see, Sugar Water Purple, uh, Midnight Society, Parallelogram, a Phonograph. Uh, this guy Liss and Sam's from San Francisco Joe Liss is an old Second City guy uh, okay. from the 80s and 90s he's coming to do a workshop that name sounds familiar yeah are you doing the classes again like you did last we're doing workshops okay. as well yeah so Asaf Ronin over um, uh, he uh, works at the Austin Creative Alliance and over at the Institution Theater he kind of is our education director so he's putting together uh, the workshop slate and we'll be getting workshops from you know Edie Patterson uh -huh. and uh um, uh, the artistic director of uh, UCB LA mm -hmm. is going to do a workshop, and uh, one of the artistic director of um, uh, Huge Theater up in Min Minneapolis, Butch Roy, big improv names, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Brian Gar. Ah, very you good. Brian Gar. Yep, yep. yep. Um, Jasmine Ellis, Kai Krebs. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a great, great week. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Uh, people absolutely need to check out this festival, and you can do passes. And I don't. I, oh, you if can do it's ba based on last year, passes are not. They're not expensive. Prohibitive. Yeah, they're. You can do. Uh, I think we have a week pass and a weekend pass. Mm -hmm. And if you're a performer, you can of course upgrade uh, to uh, a pass to get you in to see the headlining shows. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know off the top of your head the price for the passes? Okay. Those things. But the website for people to go to is outofboundscomedy.com. <laughs> there we go. Out of if we don't comedy. have it memorized, there's always a website. <laughs> what is your favorite part about being involved with Out of Bounds? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love the parties afterwards. I love seeing the shows that I had been envisioning all summer. Mm -hmm. um, I love seeing people's faces at the shows and watching people watch these acts that I've already seen on video. Yeah. I like seeing the sketches that I saw on video all summer uh -huh. come to life. That's mm -hmm. kind of fun too. Yeah. Um, and I love seeing somebody who's kind of discovering Austin Improv for the first time at that festival. Yeah. And you know, it's a really good time to suck them in to the uh, Austin yeah. comedy scene because they're just like, oh, I, I could do that. I, and so many people mm. have come out of bounds and either just decided to move to Austin as a result of it or have come out of bounds and just jumped full on their classes and they're in the festival the next year. Wow. And that happens so often because it's wow. not impossible to get into this festival after only having done this for a year. There's plenty of troops that are so good so early uh, and they rehearse diligently yeah. and they put up a good show and they're in the festival in their first year of existence you can do that in stand-up too if you write sure. good jokes put up a good show put yeah. up a good five ten minutes get it taped have the tape look good you'd be in our festival next year yeah. no problem there you go there you go wise words yeah it's not impossible I think South by is a little hard to get into Moon Tower is hard to get into. Yeah. I wouldn't even know how to get into those festivals. Yeah. And this is an open submission festival, mm -hmm. and we have a couple headliners that want to come and party with the Austin Improv scene, and some fun folks from LA, Chicago, yeah. New York, Portland, Seattle, Edmonton, Santa from China this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Cool. Yep. Very cool. Well, Dave, we are starting to wrap up, and... I'm fascinated by your career of the fourth grader, like being on stage and getting hooked, and now being not only the performer but the <laughs> almost like the, the the marionette puppet, but like in an altruistic way, not in oh, a completely a bad altruistic. way, and just you know supporting people and, and encouraging people. I and literally fostering. want anybody that wants to be a comedian to get better at being a comedian. Yeah. It's, I, I love seeing people get better at it. Yeah. And, you know, we're only here for a very short time. It's true. And I intend to cause as much laughter as I possibly can <laughs> while I'm here. Wise words. Wise words. I actually like to close these out by asking one word to describe your future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Oh my lord, <laughs> I don't know, it's so, that is such a hard, one word to scream in the future, <laughs> lord, um, I want to say rich, not money, but just like I mean, hopefully, hopefully, yeah, God willing, rich, <laughs> but like just full, that kind of rich. Yeah. When you eat it like a very rich piece of cake, I want my life to feel like that piece of cake. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. it's just like, it, it's, it's just full of things and people and love and, right. yeah. I think that's a good, that's great. And I think if anybody has listened to this entire episode, I think they get what you mean. <laughs> I hope yeah. you have since this entire episode, yeah. too. <laughs> well, that is a wrap on Comedy Wham! Presents Dave Buckman. Tell us where we can find you on social media. Uh, remind everyone where they can learn more about both Austin Sketch yep. Fetch, Austin Sketch Fest, Out of Bounds, in the Austin Film Festival? Uh, or, sure, we'll give them a shout-out. Let's 
Let's do it. Sure. Okay, I'll <laughs> give it a shot. You can reach me at Dave Buckman on Twitter. Okay. Um, or on Facebook. I'm pretty easy to find. Okay. Um, very accessible. My door's always open. You can come see me perform every Thursday night at Cold Town Theater uh, with Rachel and my buddy Mike Jastro. And uh, the troupe right now we're calling Frank and Friends by time this airs by the time you hear this it might be called something else but hopefully <laughs> every Thursday uh, at 830 um, you can find out more about Cold Town Theater at coldtowntheater.com that's co- Cold Town C-O-L-D T-O-W-N-E there's an E at the end like old timey mm-hmm. theater um, we're open seven nights a week comedy shows and classes um, you can find out more about Out of Bounds Comedy Festival at outofboundscomedy.com and Austin Sketchfest at atxsketchfest.com. That's a mouthful. Yep. It's a lot of stuff to promote. And if you're in Amsterdam in July, I hope I see you at <laughs> oh, June 25th. Yeah. That's amazing. 25 years. Yeah. Whew. Well, we hope you've enjoyed learning about how Dave got to be the comedic genius that you heard today just as much as I have. Be sure to visit ComedyWham.com and give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram at ComedyWham and like our Facebook page. You can listen to past interviews on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Review us while you're at it. This has been Comedy Wham Presents Dave Buckman. I'm Valerie and that's been funny. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.